19th century is really the time, the period when Islam, the way it exists today in the eyes of Muslims, but also Westerners, really came into being. This idea of Islam as a scriptural religion above anything else, rule-bound, uh, uh, you know, proscriptive, uh, more than permissive, uh, somewhat um, dry and, 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 you know, fun-averse, so to speak. All that came into being in a way as part, partly as reaction to the West, uh, but also this a reaction not just simply to the intrusion of the West, but also the image that the West painted of Islam as kind of, you know, anything goes, debauchery, languid, harems, and so forth. Muslims cleaning up their own act in reaction to that. Peace, people, and welcome to another installment of Real Talk with Tehran and Roxana. Today, we have the distinct honor of engaging in what I believe will be a thought-provoking dialogue with one of the foremost experts in the field of Islamic studies on his latest publication titled Angels Tapping at the Wine Shop Door, A History of Alcohol in the Islamic World. Dr. Rudy Matei is the John A. Monroe and Dorothy L. Monroe Chair of History at the University of Delaware. He is the author of four prize-winning monographs on Iranian history and the editor or co-editor of another six books. He is currently president of the Persian Heritage Foundation. And thank you, Professor Matei, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with us for this discussion. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And to start, I have to say that when I first came across your book some months ago, I wasn't too interested in reading it at that point in time, I was under the impression that it was a history of alcohol, that the history of alcohol in the Islamic world was an open and closed case where the Quran came and effectively banned the consumption of alcohol by Muslims and uh, rid Muslim societies of its production and sales all the way up to our present day. But after reading your work, the assumptions I used to hold about this relationship couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, so what was the impetus behind researching and writing about the history of alcohol in the Muslim world? And what are some key assumptions or misconceptions that people often have about the role alcohol has played within Islamic societies? And what were, were there any assumptions or misconceptions you held of your own before starting the project? All right. Um, well, first of all, I think it goes back to my own experience in the Middle East. I've been dealing with the Middle East since the 1974, to be precise. So went to Morocco first time, uh, and I was confronted with alcohol. And I've been confronted with alcohol many times thereafter, uh, not because I seek it out necessarily, but because, you know, it's there. And it's kind of ubiquitous, even though it's semi-hidden. And that precisely that sort of shadowy element to it made it interesting for me and even fascinating, precisely given the formal ban uh, on alcohol, which certainly is found in the Quran. Uh, so that discrepancy between uh, appearance and reality, I found interesting. Then I, you know, I have a, a previous, uh, a prior book on drugs and stimulants in Iranian history, uh, focus on Iran, more modern, early modern Iran. Uh, and so I was, part of that deals with alcohol. So I was already familiar with the complexity of it, because that's really what it is. The richness of the tradition, uh, which... Um, uh, is filled with ambiguity and contradiction and paradox and so forth. And I'm somewhat attracted to those kind of topics. You know, I like sort of ferreting out parts and elements of society that don't necessarily get full play, that are either hidden or uh, misunderstood, I think, both by Westerners, by Western scholars in this case, and by Muslim scholars. And as you put it, it's open and shut case. Well, you know, you open the treasure box, which I think is what it is, and you find an immense richness, certainly in traditional Islam, which I also think has been uh, sort of marginalized in modern Muslim thinking uh, in, in the modern world. Oh, most definitely. I mean, and that's one of the things or one of our focal points on this channel is that we try to focus on the more marginal topics or the topics that haven't had so much light shined upon them uh, within Islamic history, uh, because we, uh, Roxanne and I find them to be fascinating. And once people come to find out that, hey, there are these things there, they become fascinated and it gives them a total new outlook 
pertaining to Islamic history and societies. Uh, at least that's what happened for me. Um, and uh, you mentioned in your book that general histories of alcohol tend to pay little attention to Islam and Muslims, and that studies of Islam barely address the topic of alcohol beyond the Quranic stance, or at most will go no further than how uh, the theme of wine is discussed from within its poetic tradition. Uh, why do you think scholarship has paid so little attention to the history of alcohol in the Islamic world? Well, I think on the part of Muslim scholars, it's been <clears throat> somewhat of a taboo topic in modern times. You know, it's forbidden and therefore not to be approached. You know, it's forbidden and therefore it doesn't exist. Uh, and so it's only approached uh, in a negative fashion, more, more mostly, you know, to the extent that drinking occurs, it's uh, to be rejected and it's sinful. Uh, and that pretty much sums up the the, uh, the approach by most Muslim scholars, and there's actually very little work on it in one of the, you know, uh, three major languages, you know, Arabic, Persian, and, and Turkish. Uh, actually, in Turkish, there, there is a whole trend new now to, um, to, to, to open up the topic, so there are quite a few publications in Turkish, which, of course, has to do with the nature of the Turkish state, which is, of course, embattled under Erdogan, but still, you know, there's relative press freedom when it comes to things on the part of western scholars i think it's in part this open and shut case you know islam uh, is a religion that bans religion uh, that bans alcohol uh, there are exceptions people do drink some people do drink but it's kind of uh, you know a matter of hypocrisy and therefore easily dealt with and not inherently that interesting uh, so i think those are the two major uh, elements that account for the fact that there's so little in modern uh, uh, scholarly literature about it but again things are changing you know my book is kind of a part of a groundswell of interest and will no doubt generate more interest uh you know there's some there's an excellent book that came out in french uh, a year and a half ago about drinking in the ottoman empire and modern turkey so things things are changing yeah and i just want to add to that that um you know i was surprised reading uh shahab ahmed's book where he starts off with his bit of alcohol and how he kind of introduced it as being a part of Islamic culture. You know, I, it, at that time, I probably wasn't prepared to really understand what he was on about. I do have a better grasp of it now. But then that just totally threw me for a loop just to hear somebody try to say, well, no, um, I'm a Muslim. I drink and this is a part of uh, Islam or it doesn't make me any less Islamic. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you mentioned um uh... Uh, Shahab Ahmed, because he's one of the two uh, scholars who inspired me and enriched my thinking, I think. The other one is Thomas Bauer, who's a German uh, Islam specialist, who in his book, which by the way now has been translated into English as well, if you're interested, uh, argues... Well, I have that it Islam on my shelf. Oh, you do? Excellent. Um, uh, he who argues that Islam is open to uh, to ambiguity, which kind of flies in the face. modern interpretation and and you're reporting to his will or you engage in sin so he argues that there's an enormous amount of ambiguity in traditional islam shahab ahmed uh, is little is more circumstantial also harder to understand i think you know it's a great book but it should have it could could have been a lot shorter i think it's somewhat repetitive but the the basic argument i think is a very important one and that is that islam embraces contradiction doesn't lose its identity actually gets enriched by that contradiction which oftentimes is an apparent uh, contradiction so um, and, um, a muslim would his status or her status he calls it the pretext with a dash between the pre and the text so it's not pretext but the pretext before the text and then the text the quran and the hadith of course and then the uh, the context you know, Islam, of course, found itself uh, surrounded by a very old tradition, imposed uh, amalgamated with a layer of the force of Islam. And then uh, elements, behavior uh, preceding Islam was incorporated into Islam. Uh, and so he brings all that out, I think, in a very compelling uh, and interesting and for me inspiring Sashin, because i think shab uh, uh, ahmed goes a little bit too far you know he argues for example that 
a matador, a bullfighter, uh, shouting ole, which apparently comes from the word Allah, therefore becomes sort of semi-Muslim, which I think is kind of loses its its validity as an organizing principle if you go that far. But be that as it may, very uh, important and, and and inspiring, both of them. Definitely. Um, and, and for your own work on the subject, um, what what sources do you did you primarily rely on to understand the sort of the historical context of alcohol consumption in Islamic societies, and and how do you navigate potential biases or um, anachronisms in these sorts of sources? Well, the short answer is that I'm I'm an omnivore, um, meaning I. I... I look at any and all sources that are available. I don't discriminate necessarily uh, between, say, Islamic sources or sources written from an Islamic perspective or Western sources, either primary or secondary. You know, I look at all sources as inherently su subjective, you know, written within a certain context, a certain period of time with a certain viewpoint. Uh, it's, you know, what a good scholar do, does in my eyes is um, compare and contrast, bring out evidence through accumulation and 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 thickness of, 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 of viewpoints, it's trying to sort out bias and, and come up with a composition that makes sense based on, in this particular case, um, I think I have a dozen languages involved, you know, both uh, Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, uh, a lot of sources, and, and then Western uh, languages ranging from Portuguese. Uh, to Russian and uh, just a, it's a it's a process it's a never ending process Sh sifting leaving out qualifying uh, compare and contrast uh, and so forth so in other words I don't have an a priori um, perspective on, on these things you know I use as wide a possible spectrum of sources for the topic at hand um, and in terms of trying sort of to piece together um, sort of role of alcohol before and sort of after islam can you can you provide like a brief overview of the role of alcohol played in the middle east before the time of islam's ascendancy and what were the sort of pervading social and cultural attitudes towards alcohol in that region yeah of course islam as i already put it uh didn't descend from the sky uh, in, in from a historical perspective you know it it found itself in an environment uh, of you know it's a series of civilizations uh, pre-existing ones ranging from the Greek, Mediterranean, Christian, Byzantine, Persian, Persianate, uh, ultimately Turkic, Central Asian. Uh, and so it was grafted upon all these uh, prior civilizations with rich traditions, of course, that didn't simply go away. And when it comes to alcohol, if you look at it historically, I mean, the Middle East is, of course, the first uh, site in world history where viticulture is uh, practiced, you know, Eastern Anatolia, Northwestern Iran, Caucasus, going back 9,000 years. So a very venerable tradition that didn't simply dissolve and disappear into Islam, it was absorbed and, and has an afterlife. And, and all that is visible if you look at early Islamic sources. You know, the Persian tradition is very rich, you know, uh, in terms of uh, wine drinking. That's part of kind of, you know, not simply accepted behavior, but you know, completely integrated into life um, and uh, and society. And the same certainly holds for the Greek tradition, you know, Greek slash uh, Christian tradition. I mean, in, you know, in Christianity, wine plays a pivotal role. Uh, uh, and then there's a whole Mediterranean uh, tradition that which still exists. And, and, and let's not forget, very important, oftentimes forgotten that until quite recently, say in the Ottoman Empire, uh, half the population uh, was Christian, right? Armenian and Greek until they're all, you know, killed or chased out in the beginning of, you know, the turn of the century and beyond. Okay, so, um, so, so we know obviously from within the Quran that there were there were there are more than several verses sort of pertaining to alcohol mm -hmm. in that were revealed in successive stages, and obviously with the last stage, exhorting Muslims that it's it's best to stay away from it. Um, so what antecedents can we find for early Muslims relationship with alcohol in the pre-Islamic period? And, and how does the Quranic engagement with alcohol relate to these antecedents? Okay, excellent question and a really pivotal 
one, I think, uh, because it really goes to the heart of the, at least the scriptural part of Islam, the Quran, and ultimately the Hadith. Uh, you know, it's clear that alcohol was around. You know, alcohol, uh, meaning the vine, uh, doesn't necessarily thrive in the desert climate of the Arabian Peninsula, but, you know, it was cultivated in sort of the shades of, uh, of, of palm groves and so forth. So it was known, okay? And it seems fairly clear that the Prophet had a problem with wine, meaning that his companions, the Ashab, uh, used it. Uh, and it is also also seems clear that there is kind of a sequence in the Quran. Of course, the Quran is not linear chronologically, right? But one can detect, and Muslim and Western scholars have detected a certain process, a certain sequence from, say, uh, I think it's Surah 16, the, the, the bees of Nahal, which uh, considers wine to be almost the gift of God, you know, so something beneficial, uh, good nourishment, a sign uh, from God to the Ummah. So that's a positive uh, and validating uh, perspective. But then you go on from there and you look at um, Surah, um, I forget what it is, I wrote it down because, um, yeah, Al-Baqarah, al Lukao, uh, which talks about the risk of wine out um, doing uh, uh, the um, uh, the usefulness of wine. So the sin is greater than the benefit, uh, if you will. So, you know, you move to a next phase and then you have uh, apparently, the, you know, the, the, if if the, the point was to get the believers away from drinking, it didn't quite succeed because then you have the next verse, which is in Surah 4, and it said the women, which admonish believers to not to engage uh, in prayer in a state of drunkenness, which really, I think, uh, remain the topic, you know, more important than the substance itself. It was the effect, drunkenness, a clouded mind. You cannot uh, pay full attention to the Lord to, you know, during your prayer time, uh, with a, in a state of intoxication. And then finally, you have um, the uh, you have Surah Five, Al Maida, the table, which calls red wine Khamr, um, uh, together with gambling, one of the satanic enticements so completely bans it but then again you know islam continues to be preoccupied with wine even that formal ban first of all is not complete it only explicitly talks about khamar and nothing else but secondly and i think more importantly in a way it kind of defers the enjoyment of wine sublimates it almost by postponing it to the afterlife when the believers will enjoy endless rivers of wine, albeit non-intoxicating wine. Uh, so that really, I think, goes to the heart of how Islam grappled with wine and almost conceded to its force. I mean, wine, I mean, alcohol in general, of course, has proven to be a juggernaut in, in human history. It's conquered every civilization. Islam has put up a valiant effort or resistance against it. And I mean, from a secular perspective, you might argue it has made some concessions to it in a way. Uh, so that that would be my short answer to the, to the question, which I, I think it makes it absolutely a fascinating topic because it also ended up being a never ending debate. You know, Khamr, yes, OK. But what does that mean about anything else? Right. It's a discussion that lives on until today. And in particular, how did how did the post-prophetic sort of Muslim conquests did they lead to the absorption of sort of pre-Islamic Persian and Roman drinking culture? And and also well, how did on the other side, how did the arrival and spread of Islam influence the consumption of alcohol that was already taking place in that region? Well, again, process and and a long-term process. You know, the idea that Islam came and conquered and everyone converted, or most people converted has to be discarded because it's simply historically not true you know a lot of people accepted islam in part well perhaps for opportunistic reasons if you wanted to play a role in the new constellation of power you had to convert uh, and a lot of people converted no doubt out of conviction or how to sort of escape the oppressive byzantine or sasanian environment things of that nature but the mass conversion certainly in the countryside hard to access for states with limited uh, disciplining power and military power took centuries. We know that in the case of Egypt, for example. So with that, existing habits were hard to die and in many ways never died, uh, in part also because a lot of people never converted. You know, I mean, we have substantial Christian Jewish 
Zoroastrian, in the case of Iran, minorities that persist and that are actually also kind of, again, incorporated into Islam by being relegated to the status of Ahl al-Kitab, you know, the people of the book who are kind of proto-Muslims from a Muslim perspective. You know, they also have a book, a celestial book, but they just don't have sort of the latest version. So they can, they're encouraged to, to, to take the last and final step by becoming Muslims. But in the meantime, they're protected minorities. Of course, they have they pay a price, literally, higher taxes and lower social status and so forth. But with that comes the right to produce and consume their own alcohol. So right there, alcohol remains you know, sort of square and center in the in the Islamic world, certainly in the in urban environments. Yeah, there was a lot in your book that was brought, or you brought a lot to my attention via your book that I really yeah just hadn't thought about. Uh, one being that, uh, yeah, it took a long time for there to be a majority Muslim population in a lot of key Islamic cities. I mean, just in the Ottoman Empire alone, you mentioned a lot of uh, important cities within the Ottoman, within uh, the Anatolian region that were still predominantly Christian, um, as well as the fact that you know, we look at how Muslims understand their religion today, we have so much available to us at our fingertips for a long time, that wasn't the case for a lot of Muslims, and that, you know, we kind of think, okay, they convert, and then all of a sudden, they know so much about Islam, and they leave their whole uh, past behind, but that definitely wasn't the case, as you see with many Muslims who convert today, who still try to hold on to certain cultural aspects and course, adapt them. Look at Manifestation of African Islam, for example, right? But yeah, and I mean, you, you bring up another point, which is totally related, and that is that until recently, the vast majority, and you know, ninety-five percent, remained illiterate. So, to the extent that Islam was a scriptural religion, very, very few people had access to the actual tenets of Islam. It's the same in Europe with Christianity, by the way. There's no fundamental difference there, but it's easily forgotten in our age of instant, instantaneous access and supposedly full literacy uh, that you know most people also lived in far-flung regions deserts inaccessible mountains and so forth uh, and their pre-islamic faith uh, didn't uh, disappear it was simply amalgamated into some superficial knowledge and understanding of this new faith uh, so right there you can see where drinking alcohol giving it up being as hard as it is as we all know uh, continued and was simply, you know, became part and parcel and integral to the new faith, or at least, you know, re retained a corner of legit semi legitimacy. And and what uh, speaking of the non Muslim population within the Islamic empires, uh, what was the role demis have historically played in relation to alcohol consumption in the Muslim world? You touched on it a bit, but if you just don't mind going into it a bit, yeah, I, I should have worked it out a bit more. But I mean, the short answer I think is that. You know, I mean, we're talking mostly about Jews, Armenians and Greeks and Zoroastrians in the case of Iran. You know, they were both the middlemen, uh, the brokers, you know, the facilitators, if you will, because, of course, they were allowed to manufacture and consume their own. But they ended up selling to their own, but also to Muslims. Right. Uh, and they were easy. Yeah, they were lightning rods, you know, easily sort of called out uh, when there was a a crisis, uh, you know, natural disaster. It's the fault of the Armenians or the Jews, uh, and and easy scapegoats. So they they perform both functions throughout time, really, in a way until today. Certainly until recently. Hmm. Uh, did a strong Christian or Jewish presence, or is that Zoroastrian or any other of the minority communities, uh, geographically tend to coincide with higher rates of Muslim drinking, or did they tend to coincide? Yeah, of course. I mean, because, you know, these minorities, as all people, tended to congregate in certain quarters. You know, traditional Islamic cities are kind of divided between these, um, you know, ethno-religious uh, groups. You know, Jewish quarter, Armenian quarter, Muslim quarter, sometimes Sunni and Shi'i quarter, and so forth. So to the extent that you had separate and substantial, quote-unquote, minority uh, parts of the city... That's where the, the taverns, the mihon is in the Persian word, or it's also an Ottoman Turkish word, uh, tended to congregate. Uh, and so the larger the community, uh, the more incidents, the greater the incidence of these drinking establishments. 
typically on the margins, uh, but also and visited by Muslims, oftentimes under the cover of darkness. You know, all these fascinating tales of Muslims getting drunk and then sort of staying over at a Christian house to sober up so the smell wouldn't betray them. There are all kinds of these devices to square the ban on drinking with actual drinking. You know, humans are infinite in their ways of justifying and rationalizing their behavior and, and acting accordingly. Uh, but again, yeah, the density of the quote-unquote minority population was very much determinant of the incidence of drinking. Two fascinating and important examples being Galata and Pera in Istanbul. You know, I don't know if you've been to Istanbul, but, you know, the part north of the Galata Bridge was traditionally the Christian quarter, right? It was even created or founded by the Genoese in the 13th century or something like that, before the Ottomans. Uh, and Nujulfa in Isfahan, which is the Armenian quarter uh, in uh, the Iranian context. And a lot of Muslims went there uh, to uh, to get their alcohol under, the, again, sort of the cloak of darkness and with all kinds of excuses, but, but quite openly, certainly in the Iranian case as well. There wasn't all that much obfuscation about it. You know, it's amazing the mental gymnastics that Muslims uh, went through trying to uh, legitimize alcohol for their consumption, but you never really seen the same thing for pork. And you also mentioned in your book how alcohol, if you do not drink it in this life, it's delayed into the next. But again, you don't see the same for pork. I mean, uh, do, do you know why maybe Muslims were more inclined to break this rule rather than the other one. Now, I used to drink alcohol and I used to eat pork. And mind you, there's a lot of pork dishes uh, I do miss that um, I, I wouldn't mind seeing in the afterlife if they came about. But uh, did, have you ever, have you, have it racked your brain why alcohol was the first thing that they ran to rather than pork or anything else? Well, I, I make a few sort of loose remarks. It doesn't add up to a theory, but I think it's a very simple answer. And that is no one has ever become addicted to pork. You know, it's and it goes back to this juggernaut. You know, it's it, alcohol is proven to be so attractive and so irresistible. It's conquered the world, and pork is you know delectable, but you don't get addicted to pork. It's not like you eat pork five times a day and then you have withdrawal symptoms, right? Maybe okay, some people right. do, but I've never heard of that. So you know, I think that's also the reason why we don't have pork in the afterlife. It's more banal anyway, mm -hmm. and it's also you know, pork is associated in islamic thinking with disease-ridden you know pigs and so forth so it's dirty and unhygienic and that stigma i think really uh accounts for it as well and again you know what what's more beautiful than a you know a glass of wine you know a red wine with swirling in the goblet and the light of the sun reflected in it i mean then pork doesn't stand a chance there right right <laughs> uh was um was alcohol consumption uh, more prevalent among certain social classes or segments of the Muslim population? How did factors like wealth status and occupation and even gender affect who consumed alcohol? Everything is, again, the short answer. Not so much gender. I mean, it's it's very gendered, you know, and I say that in the book as well. Um, it's a male affair for the most part. Uh, to the extent that women drink, it was exclusively within the confines of the palace or the mansion or, you know, the private sphere. So we have very little inf information about it. There are, again, some notable exceptions in Iran. Mongol tradition, of course, incorporated women as, as part of the public sphere and so forth. But by and large, it's a male affair. Um, when it comes to wealth, everything, it determines everything. Because generally speaking, you can say that alcohol consumption was mostly limited to the elites, the wealthy, the privileged, you know, the rulers and their entourage on the one hand, and to commoners, meaning sort of the, the rough and, and tumble elements of, of society, the down and out, you know, drowning their sorrow uh, and finding consolation for short and hard and meaningless lives in, in alcohol, as was true in the West, of course. The middle and classes tend to be more abstemious and more more pious, you know, on that superficial level, at, at least. Uh, I think that sets up a, a, a theme that runs through the entire history, this distinction. You know, the wealthy drinking from a sense of entitlement, you know, the wealthy arrogate all kinds of privilege to themselves in any society, in any civilization, right? You will look around in our uh, societies. And and the, the 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 poor, so to speak, from a sense of being irredeemable, 
you know, it's like the debate about gin in Britain in the 18th century, right? The, uh, you know, the upper classes could hold their liquor, knew how to combine civilized life and appearance with, you know, a modest or a modest amount of intake. But the uh, down and out, you know, they went brawling and that led to social dysfun dysfunction and, and, and social malaise and so forth. And because it also played itself out in public. That's the, right there, of course, the two are combined. This dichotomy is to directly intersects with the dichotomy between public and private. And that's what I had to remind uh, people as I was sharing certain um, contents from your book on social media, because uh, after a while, people were starting get, to get the idea that you were saying that alcohol was just totally permissible in Islamic societies and that the wine was flowing, the bottles were being raised. And I had to quote another part of your book, which you mentioned more than several times throughout your book, that this was only confined to a certain segment of society. And it's actually functioned totally different than what you would see in Western society dealing with the um, dealing with the same topic. Um, and that's just something that uh, on the outset, I don't think a lot of people um, get. And it's I'm glad that you uh, brought that up. And I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And I, I, I was very conscious of that, you know, because I don't want to be accused of a sort of whitewashing anything or, or arguing that Muslims, contrary to appearance, are all drunkards. I mean, far from it. So I, I bring that in a number of times. Uh, you know, I, I want to present a nuanced uh, argument and provoke a nuanced debate. You know, I got a couple of emails by Muslims saying, there's no drinking in Islam. Well, read my book. I mean, uh, so, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I think that it's easily misunderstood that way. Like, you know, Muslims are all debauched. No, of course not. But Muslims are, are people like, you know, it's like the debates about uh, drugs, meaning alcohol, I mean, not alcohol, but uh, hashish and, and, and um, uh, cannabis and psychotropic uh, uh, substances in, in other parts of the world, including the West. It has the same kind of dichotomy, it's the same kind of ambivalence, same kind of class, you know, cocaine, it's the rich, the white who use that. And, you know, the black, the underclass uses crack, but it's the same thing, so to speak, right? But it has different effects and a different stigma and a different, uh, a different um, uh, image in society. Yeah, it's, a, it's funny that you brought that up because once upon a time, I wanted to be a chemical dependency counselor. And that was some, one of the topics that came up, the crack and cocaine, same effect, different um, uh, results as far as the legal consequences. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, it, it, you mentioned you just touched on very briefly when you were discussing sort of the segmentation between sort of wealth status and um, gender, this sort of public versus private dichotomy in the history of Islamic religious practice in relation to alcohol. Can you can you explain a little bit about that, how your research reveals that? Yeah, that's a very important one. I've already mentioned it as intersecting with this, you know, distinction between wealth the wealthy and the, and the and the poor of course the wealthy can shut shut themselves off you know behind their the high walls surrounding their compounds right that's of all time um but it, it goes deeper than that i mean islam of course uh, puts great um uh, a, a premium on on privacy the privacy of the home the haram you know the the, the precinct where the, the the man and his household live and, and it's inviolable you know there, there's you, you, the, the muhtasib you know the the um, the morality police, so to speak, cannot simply barge in and intrude upon the privacy of the of the domestic sphere. That's taboo. It's it's def it's worked out very uh, in minute detail in the hadith, for example, and luminaries such as Al Ghazali really have pronounced uh, on that. And that created a safe space right there. And it's and it still does in some ways. You know, I'm not saying that all Muslim drinking uh, is a matter of you know, private vis-a-vis -vis public, but it, it does play an important element. Also in the prosecution of drinking, you know, the law is there to punish sin, not to go look for new sin uh, by uh, violating people's privacy, right? I think it's a very important, it's actually a, a key uh, component of Islamic law. And, but of course it does create a whole sort of realm and sphere of behavior that then is countenanced and become sort of don't ask, don't tell, you know, and that's easily marginalized and dismissed as hypocr hypocrisy. But I think it's much more complex 
and richer than that. Uh, but yeah, the, to come back to the point, the public and the private sphere, uh, that dichotomy or that 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 you know the, these two poles, if you will, it's a very important component um, because um, it uh, it all it ultimately also led to this notion that as long as drinking doesn't establish a social order, the public order, we will look the other way. Because we also understand human needs and proclivities, right? I think that's kind of an underlying sense that is very much lost, I think, in much of modern Islam. This sort of sensitivity to human, you know, instinct, if you will. You know, we all have the ideal world and then we have reality and, you know, total transparency is total hell. So you do have to have some kind of distinction between private and public. And Islam is very clear about these things, created a space for things that, okay, what happens in the bedroom, we're, that's not our business. You know what I mean? It's a debate that never goes away, of course. Look at modern America, you know. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. In, in, in terms of the sort of this pragmatism that you just sort of highlighted, mm -hmm. um, how did religious scholars and the ruling elite approach alcohol consumption similarly or differently and and what was the restrictive or prohibitive influence did the clerical classes have on the drinking behavior of the elite or sovereigns particularly in the early muslim period okay well um the uh the 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 uh the take or the the discussion about alcohol I, I think i've already mentioned it never went away precisely because the ambiguity with which the muslim is left after looking at quran uh, verse um, what is it the second verse which prescribes khamr explicitly but nothing else so that immediately opened the gate to a whole debate you know trying to find loopholes quite frankly you know is nabith non uh, grape-based wine wine from made from dates is that forbidden because it's not mentioned in the quran so what are the criteria is it intoxication is it the substance itself later on the whole array of drinks that began to be introduced that didn't exist in early islam most importantly champagne and beer became the subject of again intense debate is champagne um you know simply bubbly lemonade uh is that permissible and of course you know muslims love champagne who doesn't right effervescent uh so a lot of people especially in the hanafi right because as, as I'm, i i know as i know you know there are four intellectual currents in sunni islam you have the hanbalis and you have the shafis and you have the malikis and then you have the and the hanafis the hanafis tend to prevail in the turkic and turkish part of the islamic world and the Hanafis tended to be most the most latitudinarian, the most sort of um, open-minded about other forms of alcohol. Khamar, definitely, in the Quran, no question about it. But, you know, they tended to sort of allow Nabith and other forms, and later um, champagne and beer up to a point. Never beyond the point of intoxication, of course. That, that was always the criterion. Uh, so, again, a whole debate, which mo modern Muslims have forgotten about in some ways, I think. And then the other thing, to what extent were the clerics, the ulama and the fuqaha influential in the state? Well, that varies from um, from states uh, and, and dynasty uh, to, to state and dynasty. Uh, it, you know, they typically were beholden to the state for their own income and their own status. In other words, there was always a secular imp impulse in Islam. The ruler had a lot of leeway and could withstand and even punish clerics that didn't argue his, uh, according to his um, own um, uh, uh, desires. Uh, so they're, um, you know, they, they he would shut them up. Uh, so it, it all depends. In some states, they were more influential. Uh, and in other states, in other dynasties, they were kind of marginal. They, you know, had an advisory function, exhortatory, but they weren't necessarily, their, their advice wasn't necessarily heeded.
And how did alcohol consumption patterns change significantly over the different periods within the pre-modern Muslim societies? Um, were there any key points or shifts in these patterns that really stood out to you? Because that's one of the features of your book is that you take us through the successive dynasties. And yeah, were there anything that stood out to you as far yeah, as- Yeah, I, I, I would say, I'm not sure if I'm explicit about this in the book, but on, upon reflection, I think there is a difference between the the, the the behavior uh, with uh, regarding alcohol of the traditional uh, say caliphs you know the umayyads and the abbasis most importantly uh, because you know the way it's described in the in the sources in the mostly arabic sources is kind of uh, you know part of natural uh, behavior of the elites you know the the caliph uh, engages in merriment surrounded by his nudame his uh, his boon companions right that's what kings do right there was a, also i think i talk about that visitation of christian monasteries sprinkled around the arabian peninsula where wine was available and so forth uh, i think there is a there's a difference between that and when the moment when the the persian and the persianate element becomes more important in the islamic world as of the turn of the millennium and also the in, intrusion of the turks First of all, the Turks bring new types of alcohol, hummus, you know, mare's milk, fermented mare's milk. They drink with abandon without any kind of religious um, prescription attached to it. The Persian tradition is very rich and, and continues to, to make itself felt. So when you look at the dynasties and the literature around it, beginning in that period, you know, 11th century, 10th, 11th century, you begin to see... Um, sort of drinking as not simply seen as natural but um you know an, an inherently part of uh, a civilized court hence also the advice literature that flourishes at the time the mirror for princes nasihat noame in persian you know the, the the grand vizier typically writing a sort of a, a manual of behavior for the rulers it was, was in part meant to sort of educate them in proper behavior how to deal with your women how to deal with your slaves how to uh, make sure to maintain stability in your empire by appointing shadow officials things of that nature but also how to eat and drink properly you know with a knife and fork so to speak and that includes wine there was also the element of sort of educating the rustic turks mm -hmm. the barbarians from the steppes of central asia who drank with abandon without kind of restrictions sort of you know preaching moderation so there's a different and a new element here i think in these empires that emerge from that from that whole uh, momentum yeah because i was really surprised to see that nizam al muk um in some of his works or in one of his works he had outlined the proper way for a ruler to drink and things like and things of that matter uh, that was just totally surprising especially because of who he is within Sunni Islam and how he's looked upon by many Sunni Muslims, it just totally blew my mind. Yeah, it's it's totally pragmatic in some ways, right? I mean, there's a religious element, but it doesn't prevail. It, it and again, it it makes room for human instinct and human human behavior that's irrepressible. You know, there's an Islam and as you you pointed out, but there's also the Qabus Nome, which is another famous one. Refer to that in the book. You know, he writes for his son uh, and uh, Qabus bin Bushungir, you know, one of the rulers at the time. And, and you know, he argues, and, and this is a very important element in Islamic literature in general, that, you know, drinking is, well, perhaps not encouraged when you're young, but kind of inevitable. You know, the young want to have fun, right? You have to make space for that. So son, drink, make merry, fornicate, uh, but do it with moderation. And at some point you have to clean up. Because it shouldn't come at the expense of good governance. You can't just be a drunken ruler all the time. So moderation and growing up. And that sort of spills over into a general type of advice in traditional Islam. And that is, you know, bound up with the idea of sin in Islam, which, of course, is not an irretrievable and, and incorrigible act. You know, you can always come back to God. There is no original sin in Islam, as in Christianity, certainly Catholicism, right? Um but even though in Catholicism too, you can, you know, engage in confession. So that sort of, you know, abrogates your sins. So there's something like that in Islam. You can come back to God. So drinking, again, is not unpardonable. You know, there's toba. You know, there's repentance. And typically you repent after a life of, you know, making merry and having a 
good time at age 50 because that's when you sort of start making your you know your 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 balance sheet and you have to start preparing for the afterlife you have to clean up so toba comes at age 50 at at you know at the latest at age 60 people live shorter lives of course because you have to prepare for you have to you have to stand before god with a clean slate uh so uh, so you have this whole you know series of prescriptions about how to deal with alcohol along those lines you know because life is a series of stages of course right Definitely. Uh, and the last phase is a matter is a matter of cleaning up and, and coming you know to terms with your behavior in past life and moving on to uh what was in your uh well moving on to my favorite part of your book which was your chapter concerning uh, alcohol and Islamic art and literature, um, because that's really where alcohol tends to stand out for a lot of people. Um, and it was, or in the Abbasid period, um, was marked by significant advancements in literature, science, and the arts. Uh, how did alcohol feature in these creative expressions? And what do these references tell us about its role in society? Okay, it's an extremely rich topic. And again, one that does get very little play in modern Islamic education, I think, unfortunately, because it is so rich. Um, again, you know, I have to sort of stick to the main points. Um, it, it figures profusely in poetry, uh, in painting as well, especially in the Eastern half, in the Persian half, where representation of the human body is much more uh prevalent and in the uh, sort of arabic or air part uh and it figures uh, most importantly in sufi poetry right the khamriya the wine poetry is you know immensely rich it goes back in part to pre-islamic models you know because there were these pre-islamic poets singing the virtues of wine and so forth so alcohol uh meaning wine because that's the only type of alcohol that figures in Islamic poetry and especially in Sufi poetry and mystical poetry is both a substance and a metaphor. You know, the intoxicating quality of wine sort of stands for the intoxicating quality of the mystical bond between the Sufi and the divine, right? You, you lose yourself in a swirl of, of intoxication. Your mind is clouded and, and becomes clear in that cloudedness, so to speak. And, and again, there is also the element of wine standing for the infinite complexity and diversity and variety of the creation of the world, the universe as created by God. So again, the beauty of wine swirling in the goblet with the light refracted through the sun, sunlight and so forth. Um, and so, you know, standing for the kaleidoscopic beauty of, of, of the, uh, the universe, all of it created by God. It also represents, I think, the... Um, the notion of the Sufi having risen beyond the status of the ordinary believer, you know, regular uh, commandments and obligations, prayer, the fasting and so forth are good enough for a believer who has a certain intellectual level, but, you know, that's for him. But the Sufi is a member of a an elite, uh, you know, a, a discerning class, risen has risen above the sort of standard and somewhat banal uh, 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 obligations and um you know his special bonds with god uh, allows him to open the treasure box uh, uh, of the universe and wine uh, is one of them and then there's something else wine of course also stands for defiance that's a whole element an important element that is also expressed in poetry abu nuez for example you know he talks about that it's both the defiance of um uh, against um the, the very uh, prescription of wine, sort of, you know, um, 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 rebelliousness against the standards and the norms, scandalizing the bourgeoisie, so to speak, right? Uh, there is also the idea of defying and standing up to the cant and the hypocrisy of the clerics, you know, who fulminate against wine but then through the back door enter the tavern themselves right the sheer hypocrisy and on a deepest level i think it's a defines almost a cri de coeur a, a lament by poets such as chayam for example against the inherent unfairness of the universe of our lot as as humans we will all die in pain 
most of us. So this sort of, you know, oh God, how, how can you allow this to happen? God is supposed to be good. And how do we square this with all the evil in the world? And wine then becomes a metaphor, a sort of skirting blasphemy, really, in many cases, never fully, because there's never the denial of the oneness of God, of Tawheed, but wine becomes an instrument in this kind of pushing the envelope of almost accusing God of having created an unjust universe. Mm. And and what do we do with that? I think that's that's on the deepest level, the role of wine, especially in, in, in Sufi uh, poetry or in, in, you know, poetry in general. Quite aside from the beauty it evokes, you know, the endless series of metaphors that wine uh, uh, evokes. Um, and it's a shame if this is not taught in Islamic education. I mean, uh, you, you really don't get all of what you explain just by looking at it. And it does take some education or information so people can actually really understand what's in front of their face. Because, I mean, I find these paintings to be magnificent, magnificent. But I think if more people understood what was uh, involved with the artwork itself, you know, it would bring out a lot more of it. I mean, you just mentioned Omar Khayyam as, as, a, as a brilliant example of that. Are there any other sort of poets, or writers or artists who you feel particularly were able to sort of embody this contradictory relationship between Muslims and alcohol in their work? Yeah, in the Arab tradition, I would single out, I've already mentioned him, Abu Nuez, who, of course, half Iranian, half because he was from Basra. Or no, I think he was from Ahwaz in what's today Khuzestan, which is an Iranian territory, but he wrote in Arabic. So he can, can be claimed by both, which is all topical in and of itself, of course. You know, I think he's the most prominent one of, of playing with alcohol and sort of pushing the envelope to dangerous levels, uh, but infinitely beautiful. Also, quite a bit of him, uh, of his work has been translated into English and other European languages. So it's accessible even to those who don't know Arabic. Uh, in the Iranian tradition, are, of course, the ones who are, who are at the origin of Persian poetry as a separate genre written in Persian, you know, Manu Chihri and Unsuri. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's Hafiz, the combination of Sufi poetry, you know, Hafiz who stains his prayer mat with wine in order to show his contempt for the hypocritical clerics. He can't stand them, you know, uh, because true religion is, has to do with integrity. So he will go as far as stain his prayer carpet with wine. Order, in, also in order to show how far above he is, how, how far he has risen above the sort of the pedestrian expressions of Islam, which are riddled with hypocrisy and opportunism from his perspective. <clears throat> so those are some of the people that I also talk about in the book, of course. Um, and in terms of literature from, a, not, not from a Muslim perspective, but from an Orientalist perspective, writing at that period about uh, Muslims' relationship with alcohol, a trope that you, you've is frequently found in these sorts of writings is of Muslims sort of being binge drinkers. And I wanted mm -hmm. to know how much you felt that that was reflective of historical reality. That's a good question. Um, well, I think it's true for the most part. First of all, there are too many uh, people who make the same observation. They don't necessarily borrow from one another. <clears throat> Their intent is not necessarily pernicious, you know, putting down Muslims or in all of them it's just a clean observation and it also makes sense because you know the forbidden fruit because that's ultimately what it remains in islam has in, its inherent uh, attractiveness and almost automatically leads to excess you for, forbid it and people run with it right because it becomes this sort of again forbidden fruit uh, and so it's also not integrated in islamic culture which is the saying the same in different words in, into sort of you know the the idea of conviviality, sitting together with people, having a good meal, the French Mediterranean way. You don't overdo it. You drink two glasses to enhance the atmosphere. And then you savor the wine. You know, you talk about, this is a Bourgogne, this is a Beaujolais, what year? And there's a lot of claptrap about it. But still, it enhances the atmosphere of the togetherness. That tradition doesn't exist in Islam, cannot exist in Islam, because it is forbidden, at least Hamr is forbidden. Uh, so that also means you cannot allow for any kind of sort of compromise, if you will. It's all or nothing. And again, that leads to, you know, people having a meal. And in Islamic culture, typically it's quickly eaten. Even the meal itself is not necessarily a source of convivial togetherness, right? 
And then you move the men to a separate room, the way you go to a separate room to smoke pot, so to speak, with the people you trust. And then you, you know, bring it out, right? But it leads to excess, you know, because the idea is not to socialize, it's the idea to get drunk as fast as possible. So that's also why Muslims typically prefer hard liquor when it became available, right? The effect is so much faster and more direct. So again, it sounds like an Orientalist stereotype, and sometimes it is, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's part and parcel of a general sort of description of, you know, languid Muslims, apathetic, not very energetic, and so forth, debauched. But but by and large, I think it's a you know it's it's a it's an image that uh, that that gets to the truth um, but again it's offset by all my disclaimers and all my what i hope is nuanced approach to the whole topic and in moving on to sort of the more the more modern period and and in terms of the way you structure your book how how did the colonization of certain islamic states in the 19th century affect the way alcohol was consumed within them i mean colonization was such a as you know a significant event for them uh, the yeah it, I, I, it's like 19th century is crucial you know because it's the the real it's not the beginning but it's the crystallization of european influence western influence on the islamic world militarily politically economically uh it's the beginning of elites in the beginning of the Ottoman Empire and in Egypt, Muhammad Ali, for example, beginning to uh, adopt, uh, well, first of all, new types of drinks, you know, champagne and cognac and so forth. Uh, but more importantly, and it begins at the top, you know, certainly Ottoman Empire, the, the Sultan coming out of his palace gradually, in and of itself, it has nothing to do with alcohol. It's about, you know, great greater visibility, emulating European courts in order to create a bond with people you know going out on tours and you know riding with boat rides on the bosphorus and so forth showing up at um, receptions um, organized by european legations uh, and then gingerly over time you know drinking a glass of port and then liking it and then ordering a number of bottles so you have a whole shift you know the sultan moves out of the confines of his palace um, and then the elite gravitates towards Western ways gradually, you know. And of course, at the end of the century, you have a, a sea change because by this time we have modern hotels uh, and we have the beginning of modern tourism of the elite, the British elite, so to speak. And with that comes, you know, drinks and drinking, confined, uh, but still far more visible than what was ever uh, present and, and available uh, beforehand. And so Western ways in general, there's a lot of emulation. Uh, I think that, that's the best term that sort of sums it up uh, of Western ways on the part of the elite. And then, of course, it gradually trickles down uh, in very complex ways. Uh, but it's, so it's, it's mostly that. New drinks uh, are introduced, uh, new ways of consuming it, and also more you know Western types of ways, uh, even though you have, and I give many examples of that, these elites who then get roaring drunk so they stick to the old ways with new you know beverages so to speak um but uh and 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 sort of the new infrastructure that comes with the railway connects europe to istanbul in the 1880s so tourists come you have the first hotels electricity comes in uh and so the concentration of uh bars and 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 sort of these um you know dark and dank taverns they they continue to exist but now side by side with those we begin to have sort of modern establishments you know garden uh, you know beer gardens and, and and lounges and so forth western music is being played again for a tiny segment of the population so you have a juxtaposition for a long time between these unsavory unhygienic taverns still visited by the down and out for the most part on the one hand and then you have this intrusion of the, the modern world, if you will, which of course continues in far, you know, into the 20th century and until today. You know, you have the building of the Hiltons and the Marriotts in Muslim capitals in the 1960s, and now you have Dubai and and, and you know the Emirates and, and Qatar and so forth. And uh, along with modernity, um, you discuss the fact that which. Uh, the fact that much of the Middle East entered a phase of alcohol imperialism uh, during the colonial period. 
could you explain how this manifested itself? Yes, that's a very important topic, a very rich one. Uh, and it's one I debate, meaning I don't simply adopt it. Uh, I qualify it for a couple of reasons. This idea that the West simply imposed alcohol consumption on Middle Easterners, on Muslims. First of all, it denies the agency of Muslims. And so I already use the term emulation. And I think that's half the story. I mean, Muslims love what came their way. It didn't have to be, you know, poured down their throats, so to speak, literally, right? Um, second of all, the Europeans were uh, behaved very differently in the Islamic world from the way they behaved in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, where indeed you have kind of a, you know, an imposition of, of capitalist ways that included Uh, selling of alcohol, a cheap, better of, of doing so in the Islamic world. They, they knew that alcohol was a very sensitive topic. So, for example, the French in North Africa, they followed what they call the politique des égards, you know, a, pol a policy of, of caution and circumspection. You know, they they following tradition, uh, meaning by uh, issuing all these edicts where, you know, the B, as they call them, the alcohol selling establishment could not be in the vicinity of mosques, a uh, certain percentage, very low percentage in Muslim quarters, majority Muslim quarters, uh, opening hours, the type of alcohol sold, so they were very sensitive. Uh, and I'm not absolving the French. For example, they have, you have to also have to distinguish, you know, Algeria was always seen and treated as an extension of France. So they were really, uh, until World War II, when they needed support of the Algerians, never any restrictions on alcohol. But in, in uh, Morocco and Tunisia, which were protectorates, of course, they were very careful about these things. So, you know, sort of localizing alcohol to certain districts and so forth. The British in the Ottoman Empire are faced with a, a different, or I should say the Ottomans are faced with a different type of alcohol imperialism. And that is the British, um, they, um, they acquired what they called, um, what's the term, um, um uh, the uh, oh god what is the term the, the um uh, capitulations right which gave their own subjects certain rights the right to operate commercially in the ottoman empire with very few restrictions certainly no restrictions imposed by the ottomans and these capitulations also included British clients meaning Ionian Greeks and Maltese and so forth Italians uh, expatriates and so forth. So they began to open up drinking establishments, even in Muslim quarters, uh, and open grog shops in, uh, say, the Delta in Egypt. And I talk about that. Uh, and the British didn't like that because it created problems of drunkenness, but also confrontation with Islam and its authorities and so forth. But effectively, they didn't do very much about that. They sort of hid behind this, well, this is the law, there's nothing we can do about it. So that, that would be the best example of alco imperialism, if you will. But again, it's a rich and complex subject. And it's certainly not a matter of, you know, the West it came and, you know, it has been trying to get us addicted and weaken Muslims deliberately, which is kind of the most extreme version of that. And the other thing is, of course, very important aspect is that, you know, at the late 19th century, we have a whole different kind of, a, you know, a whole, a, 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 another type of change, the beginning of nationalism, uh, and again, a reaction against this Western intrusion in the Ottoman Empire in, in particular. Uh, and so the, the role of the minorities, which has always been the, that of purveyors and facilitators, they now become branded, both from the traditional religious forces, right, uh, but also from the new, mostly secular nationalist forces, seen as handmaidens, collaborators with the West. And that's the beginning of a whole new phase of resistance against alcohol in the late Ottoman Empire, especially. Iran is a little different. It has kind of a different trajectory. How did the discourse around alcohol shift due to modernization? I know in the previous, it was argued in one way, and then as modern modernity came about, they tend to view alcohol in a slightly different way. And I was actually quite surprised by that myself. I thought that had always been the case um, early on, but 
from your book, I got the picture that no, this is the discourse surrounding alcohol that you see a lot of Muslims engage in is really a product of modernity. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would even go so far. I can say this in the book that the 19th century is really the time, the period when Islam, the way it exists today in the eyes of Muslims, but also Westerners, really came into being. This idea of Islam as a scriptural religion above anything else, rule bound, uh, uh, you know, proscriptive, uh, more than permissive. Uh, somewhat um, dry and 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 you know fun averse, so to speak. All that came into being in a way as part partly as reaction to the West, uh, but also this a reaction not just simply to the intrusion of the West, but also the image that the West painted of Islam as kind of you know anything goes, debauchery, languid harems, and so forth. Muslims cleaning up their own act in reaction to that. So that's a whole fascinating debate. Uh, but I think there is something there uh, that, you know, the image of Islam, it really originates in that period. And that the whole traditional formation of Islam and the way it manifests itself is is is, is quite different. And that's precisely what I try to bring out in the book. Um, the, 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 the actual answer to your question is that uh, uh, alcohol becomes medicalized. Uh, in the 19th, course of the 19th century, again, under the influence of Europe, because it's the same thing in Europe, you know, al alcohol becomes subjected to the gaze of doctors and ultimately psychiatrists, you know, as harmful to the body and the mind. It has to do with a state that begins to take on new tasks, disciplining society, uh, fostering welfare, but also economic growth and so forth. And alcohol in an unregulated and 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 uh, unbound way doesn't fit into that picture, so it becomes an object of scrutiny, uh, and is seen. There's of of course also these all these advances in medical knowledge, so alcohol really becomes a matter of um, hygiene almost. You know, social in part rejected for for that reason. In other words, the 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 religious uh, debate doesn't go away, but there's a new layer added to it. And that is this, this idea of medicalizing alcohol. And you mentioned it a bit, but you didn't get go well, too much. In, you didn't get in, into it too much. Uh, how did pan arabist and nationalist secularization of the Muslim world in the post-colonial period affect the alcohol industry? Well, it's a variegated picture, like everything else. You you can't just you know generalize about what forty Islamic countries. Uh, but to the extent that I uh, that you can, I will say that, you know, you have, have these countries such as Egypt and Nasser and uh, uh, Syria under the Ba'ath and Iraq under the Ba'ath and ultimately Saddam Hussein were uh, ended up being military regimes, deeply secular, and alcohol was not seen as a problem. It was you know, bars existed and hotels and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, there was a reaction to that. What today we call Islamic fundamentalism is in part a reaction to the secular nature of these various regimes. Ataturk in Turkey is, of course, a major example in the non-Arab world. The Pahlavis in Iran, the ultimate Iranian example, it all amounts to the same thing. You know, they paid some lip service to the clerics and religious sensibilities by, say, shuttering uh, bars and alcohol uh, purveying venues uh, during Ramadan, for example, having certain pictures on Muslim drinking, uh, but by and large uh, being somewhat indifferent to, to it. But again, the, you know, the reaction uh, that came, beginning, of course, in 1929 with the Muslim Brothers in Egypt, is in part a reaction to that you know, intrusion of billboards and advertisements in newspapers, but also on the street. Again, sort of the public appearance of alcohol in, in unprecedented ways. Mm. And, and then, of course, totally uh, associated with the West and its evil, forgetting the rich tradition in Islam itself. So um, the, the rise of political Islamism in the second half of the 20th century obviously changed governmental policy and measures quite significantly. Um, can you explain 
you know, what were those changes? Um, and obviously you've already mentioned that sort of this vast geographical region had a huge variation varying from, you know, what was happening in Iran to Turkey to the Maghreb, et cetera. But can you explain a little bit about how this differed, how the sort of effect of political Islamism differed from country to country? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, political Islam manifests itself differently in different countries, you know, bound up with tradition and, and precedent and so forth. Um, so the Iranian revolution is very, very different from, say, the Algerian uh, reaction to the secular regime that took over after the French were chased out in 1960. Um, but by and large and generalizing, you can say, I think that... Um, political Islam has made strides and has gained victories, but certainly has not won uh, the war at all, in part, again, because Islam is such a juggernaut and such an irresistible force, but also, uh, more importantly, in a modern context, because it's completely bound up with sort of global con culture, youth culture, fun-seeking culture, that, you know, incorporates now youth, especially around the globe, you know, Muslims, as most people, were rather cut off from the world until a few decades ago. Uh, even those who read newspapers because they were heavily censored and, you know, all the sort of modern popular culture was left out. But now everyone has access to click away, right, on, on social media. So that is all unstoppable. And so Muslims have had to make concessions to that, in part by imposing or allowing new types of hypocrisy. So bars behind thick curtains and, you know, invisible inside and side streets and so forth, marginalizing drinking by relegating it to, you know, lounges in between cities somewhere tucked away on the highway, right? Uh, and, or, or in certain districts in Erdogan has been in busily doing that. Uh, they have had influence on legislation, of course, but we all know legislation and practice are not necessarily the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it's 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 it, I think it's an awkward juxtaposition these days uh, between uh, a newly activist Islam that tries to live by the text uh, that has completely forgotten the rich tradition that try to lay out in my book. Uh, and that is faced with, you know, a, a major opponent. And that is, again, alcohol as a, also as a big moneymaker, of course, right? So um, it's 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 a complicated thing. Turkey is the best example, I think, the most concrete example of these two forces vying with one another, also for the heart and soul of the country, ultimately. The very identity of what it makes, what it means to, what it, the very... Yeah, Turkish identity, what it means to be a Turk is to completely bound up with, symbolically at least, with you either drink or you don't. You're you're a black Turk, uh, a, a Bias Turk, uh, sorry, a white Turk, Bias Turk, which means you're secular, you're open to the world, you you live according to the principles of Ataturk, uh, you want to be modern European, so to speak. On the one hand, or you're a Kara Turk, you're you're a Black Turk, you're from the countryside, uh, you're you're an Erdogan fan, um, you 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 abide by Islamic tradition, uh, and so these two forces are really pitted against one another. And again, alcohol is kind of a marker there because the White Turk drinks rake uh, or beer, and then the Black Turk doesn't. And Erdogan has, of course, tried to um, sort of um, uh, price alcohol out of existence by by imposing ridiculous taxes on it. Mm -hmm. So now you pay like twenty five dollars for a flesh, for for a bottle of rake, which is cheap booze. Uh, so there there are all these different ways in in which uh, regimes, Islamically informed regimes, have tried to uh, impose restrictions and 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 marginalize and at least contain the incidence of the consumption of alcohol and in some cases of course uh, has i'm not sure where they really have succeeded but in the countries where they seem to have succeeded the most they really have lost the most iran being the best example you know alcohol is totally forbidden you go to iran and it's one big party it's indoors or it's in the form of coca bottles in uh, in a restaurant you know the owner and he fills it with 
vodka, right? A Sprite bottle on your table. Uh, you know, you have your wedding and there are these wedding halls are out in the desert and sort of out of sight. It doesn't exist. And everyone knows you have the best parties in Iran. It's wonderful. Uh, but officially it doesn't exist. So again, new forms of hypocrisy doesn't solve the problem because it also leads to all kinds of social ills. And again, excessive drinking. Or, or in the case of uh, Tur Turkey pricing it out of existence, you know, people started start making it in their own bathtub. Mm. And they gravitate towards, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, methylene alcohol, you know, poisoned alcohol, dubious quality but leading to death, so. And now that foreign tourism plays an integral role in many Eastern European countries, how has that affected the way alcohol is viewed and consumed, especially in places like Dubai, whereas, you know, as you mentioned, these places were closed off to the world for a long time, only in recent decades. And even if they had a alcohol consumed in the region, I have to, I imagine that after, uh, tourism and modernity and more people, it definitely changed the way this thing plays out. Yeah, and again, it varies from country to country. You know, in, in Iran, again, all it's all behind closed doors. But in Egypt, for example, uh, you know, have drinkies. You know, there are these official, mostly Coptic-run uh, establishments where you can just order, right? And the guy with a scooter and a black box and everyone knows what they're all about, they brings it to your door. Um uh, and, you know, it's concentrated in big hotels or in resorts. And resorts are, by definition, secluded and, and basically a precinct where tourists congregate. And it may be some elite natives, so to speak, and the personnel who, serves, uh, who serve the tourists. Uh, so, again, it's, it's contained. Uh, and then, of course, a solution, quote, unquote, has been found in so-called halal tourism, where you have resorts in Turkey or in Tunisia, where Muslims go with families in a safe, non-alcoholic setting. Mm. Um, but the idea of alcohol being this sort of global force now, very much bounded with youth culture and vitality and having fun and so forth, is again an unstoppable force because you know with festivals attached to it in places like Morocco and and and, and elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, is 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 a phenomenon that, you know, is is very attractive because it brings a lot of revenue. You know, and we all know in in traditional times too. We haven't talked about that, but you know, whoever pious a sultan might be, first of all, uh, he would proclaim a ban uh, at, at his accession in order to establish legitimacy, his legitimacy. But that ban would almost invariably fall by the wayside under the need for tax revenue. You know. Wine, alcohol brought in lots of fiscal revenue, which they could not forego. And 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 nothing has changed in that sense. Right. I mean, so, you already touched on this a little bit it, it, with you also. Oh, in other words, there's always a dilemma. So sorry. Yeah, it's it's the same. The last thing I wanted to say is, you know, again, there's nothing exclusively Muslim about that. It's the same with cigarettes. You know, there's been this campaign going on in the West for half a century now. And, and, you know, the more successful governments become in banning and, and making uh, cigarettes look uh, awful and terrible, the more they are deprived of income. So there's always this dilemma between the two. I, I mean, it, 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 yeah, and in terms of the what you just described, um, in terms of like the influence of youth culture and, and media influences in particular, um, how does the way alcohol is depicted in contemporary media in the Muslim world differ from the way it was depicted in sort of the pre-modern Islamic poetry and art that we discussed earlier? And, and also, how do contemporary Muslims sort of interpret those pre-modern depictions that are now so, so vastly dislocated from our understanding of alcohol in the Islamic world today? Yeah, I, you know, I, I how shall I put this? Um, you know, to the extent that advertisement is allowed in the Islamic world, and most country it isn't, countries it isn't, just as is true in the West, of course, a lot of countries where alcohol advertisements are not permitted, um, it probably pretty much takes the same form as um, uh, as it does in the West. You know, and, and I, I haven't been to Turkey in a few years, but I spent quite a bit of time there. And then 2013 again, and, and a bit later, uh, and and there were lots of advertisements of 
you know, F is beer, you know, with long, young people sort of, you know, having a great time, men and women, right, on billboards, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, adorning uh, the entrance of bars and so forth. Uh, also in newspapers. Uh, I think Erdogan has clamped down on that to some extent. I'm sure to what extent he has succeeded. Um, but I don't think there are advertisements for alcohol in most Islamic countries. Uh, and more importantly, you know, there is a huge, and you use the word, I think, the disconnection, the disjointment between the current perception of Islam and the and the uh, the oblivion of the very, very rich tradition. In other words, who knows about Abu Nawaz today in, in modern Islamic culture? Uh, you know, alcohol is almost exclusively relegated to the realm of, you know, pernicious Western influence associated with Western dysfunctionality, with loneliness, lonely men sitting in bars, uh, wife beaters, uh, you know, psychological problems, addiction, uh, youth problems, and so forth. Uh, and to the extent that these problems exist, and at least they're oftentimes also exclusively ascribed to Western influence, uh, which I think is, well, first of all, it's a mistake, and because it doesn't lead to any kind of solution, but it's also hypocritical, of course. Um, <clears throat> but again, I think if the Islamic world allowed itself to embrace again or you know at least acknowledge reality and the fact that your culture was so rich and that it wasn't just as a matter of hypocrisy and you know this aspect of human behavior living in the shadows but came out in glorious poetry and beautiful painting uh, i think that would humanize the whole thing and 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 give it a place and you can still prescribe it and marginalize it and, and make it hard to get and so forth uh, because drugs in general, alcohol is a hugely destructive force around the world. Let's be honest about it, right? But no one has found a solution. But I think honesty uh, goes some way towards at least facing the problem in a, in, in a proper way. I think it's of the culture which is not it doesn't just exist it doesn't just consist of uh uh you know um ibn ibn taimiya and his his stern take on things right right um just to just sort of wrap up this this discussion you sort of you described your book in your conclusion as sort of viewing out islam through the lens of alcohol and alcohol through the lens of islam what insights do you hope both these lenses have sort of revealed through this project? Well, again, you know, the the I the 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 notion that Islam is immensely rich in its traditional form, and I've tried to unlock part of that. Hopefully, uh, Muslims will uh, it will will access this and and be open to it. I also really hope that my I know my book is being translated into Persian as we speak. And I hope it will eventually be translated to Turkish and Arabic as well. Uh, I hope it will lead to some kind of debate uh, beyond rejectionism. Uh, it doesn't exist in Islam. It's not permitted, so it doesn't exist. Or it's just, you know, the, the evil uh, influence of the West. Very unproductive and, and, and just um, in, inflammatory and, and divisive. Uh, and I think what we need to have is a cultural debate that's open-minded and and that enriches all of us and i think that's what i've tried to do in the book you know and lay out this very rich tradition uh, and and the complexity of, of islamic culture islamic culture is diverse is multiplicitous and it is open traditionally to all kinds of impulses from outside without losing its identity that's the point i think in the end or at least my point Right. And you brought up something uh, I thought was very important in your book. I can't remember within the context, but it really stood out for me. You know, uh, a lot of Muslims within today, uh, it, it was quoted by someone who is more critical of Islam. But, you know, I'm I, just to paraphrase, I'm scared. Therefore, I believe, you know, and right. I really think that there's a lot of the ways Muslims uh, react to modernity is out of fear of losing 
um, in Islamic identity when that has never been the case historically, even with the pressure of different cultural forces coming in, sometimes overpowering, it still didn't, the, the whole thing didn't unravel just because of that. It, if not, stood it stood even stronger afterwards. So, uh, and yeah, we just have a couple more questions. Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah, just just you know, just following up on that, I think that's a very important point because um, it, it's um, uh, this idea of um, oh, forget I forget what I was trying to say. Forget about that. Let's just skip this and ask your final question, so to speak. All right, no but, worries. No, I wanted to say no, no. I mean, if you can pick up on this, what I wanted to say is that. You know, the reaction as such, as an instinctive reaction, as a gut one, seems natural. It's also not uh, limited to the Islamic world. In the West, in conservative circles, we have the same kind of knee-jerk reaction, rejection. But A, modernity is ineluctable. You know, you cannot wish it away. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's part and parcel of our modern way of living. We're all modern in that sense of the word. So you better come to terms with it, right? Um and uh, you know, don't just focus on uh, on, on alcohol as the, as the ultimate evildoer, because I think you're missing the point. Definitely. Um, and you, your survey of Islamic drinking focuses on some very specific geographical areas, empires, and contemporary nation states. Are there any aspects or locales that you didn't have the space to cover that you hope will be addressed in future scholarship? Absolutely. I, I don't pretend to cover the entire Islamic world. I say that with some justification in my introduction. Uh, I don't deal with uh, uh, anything uh, east of India, Muslim India. So the largest Islamic country in terms of numbers, Indonesia is completely disregarded. Malaysia, uh, I don't deal with Central Asia other than the, in the classical period. In other words, no Islam under Russian or Soviet uh, influence, which is a whole different connected but still a related uh, a topic um, and I say that I justify that in part uh, for lack of expertise I'm not that familiar with Islam east of India so to speak uh, but also because the book was already too long I had to cut 20,000 words mm -hmm. so I, I didn't have the luxury of <laughs> including two more chapters so to speak but I invite my colleagues to explore those elements and those parts and those periods. Oh yeah, definitely. We would like to see um, more of what was in the book and more, more of what you weren't able to put into the book um, brought to light in separate publications. They definitely would be very interesting reads. And I know historians don't like to predict the future. They tend to deal more with the past, but how do you predict the Islamic relationship with alcohol or how do you predict that this relationship will develop in the future? Yes, far be it from me, from me to, to predict anything. Again, historians exclusively deal with the past, and those who predict the future are usually wrong, <laughs> just like a compliment. Um, but anyway, to the extent I'll say anything, uh, I think it's going to be for the, for the foreseeable future more of the same, an awkward juxtaposition of this notion of a ban. I don't think, the, I don't see many signs out of the, what is now the traditional world, Islamic world, of, of opening up, of, of getting out of its sort of fixated position of rejectionism of alcohol and to some extent modernity. Maybe, and I do see some hope in young people throughout the Islamic world because they are breaking with norms and traditions and so forth. They tend to be more open-minded. Of course, the internet works both ways, right? Social media and so forth. But the awkwardness, this juxtaposition, the looking away, allowing it, against all odds because you can't you know you're just trying to contain it uh all these things will uh, i think can be with us for the foreseeable future and beyond that i don't want to go all right and thank you professor mate for your hard work uh in writing this book it was i definitely enjoyed it it was a difficult uh book to put questions together for just because you know, within 350 or 370 something page or probably more than that, 
you added so much. And just to kind of pick out the gems, there were so many uh, to talk about, but you did an excellent job discussing your book and answering our questions. Is there anything else that you would like to leave with us before? Uh, well, yeah, first of all, you, you you did a marvelous job uh, posing intelligent questions, which I think enhanced the quality of the interview. And thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it was fun and it was for me. Thank you. All right. Well, we hope to have you on again. I mean, you know, you've written extensively about uh, Iran. Um, that was one of the questions, like, like what what, what got you into uh, studying Iran as a geographical area out of all of what you could have pertaining to the Islamic world? Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind answering that last question. Well, the short answer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Iran, uh, uh, I, I gravitated towards Iran after high school because I'd learned Latin and Greek in high school. And uh, I read about the Persians in Greek, you know, 500 BC, so to speak. And it sort of, you know, in inspired me to look towards on the, towards the other side, a non-Greek perspective. So I wanted to do pre-Islamic Iran initially, and then they told me there are no jobs. So then I was sort of moved in the direction of post-Islamic Middle East. And I studied Arabic and Persian. And then I went, I visited the Arab world, Egypt, Morocco, and I ended up in Iran. In kind of an exchange program, 1976, a long time ago, Shah was still in power, and I was absolutely overwhelmed and, and completely taken and intrigued and fascinated with Iran, and I've, I still am, 45 years later, almost 50 years later, because Iran, for, to me, has this you know depth in terms of philosophy and the search for the meaning of life, and integrated in Islam, but be going beyond it and you know, there are all these precedents and there's it's this vibrant culture even today there are 400 bookstores in tehran it's an amazing culture uh so i'm still working on iran but i've never lost my interest in the arab world or, or in turkey for that matter because i have many different interests <laughs> yeah and if you're anything like me having many different interests it's kind of hard to put all your eggs in one basket or when you focus on one the other one's getting away and then you try to run to the other one and then you run back because you feel like it, it, it can create a bit of confusion well on that note professor Matei, thank you for all of your hard work and we hope to speak to you again and we can't wait for what more you have in store as far as uh, publications uh, are concerned thank you so much real pleasure